thank you so much for joining us for the Fem Future Society. These conversations, as I always say, are the ones that nourish me so much. But I love just getting to know, and I haven't done a ton of research, so I'll be, you know, inspired to learn more about you together with everyone else that's learning about you. Um, but before I ask you about your background, what has kept you fed in the past year if you haven't been able to travel and do your thing? Mm, yeah, you know, good question. Um, I have recently realized what it was, what it's been is um, comedy. I love stand up comedy and I love, you know, I love, I just love to laugh, you know, I, and I'm always looking for that in my normal life. And then I hadn't really been watching comedy shows and stuff like stand up and I started watching them on Netflix and whatnot, you know, just streaming all that. And I and even just having it on the background, just hearing people laugh and it's really lifted me up. So I, oh, definitely good. comedy podcasts and shows. Have you ever performed comedy? No. Have you done an improv class? No. Well, like in school, in middle school. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> it seems like someone with such an education background. So we're now back into who you are. And so how do you describe yourself and how you describe your current work right now? So who I am, I mean, I do have a foot in education. I'm a futurist. Um, and recently I've kind of taken to the term futurologist. I'll just throw that out there to let yeah. people think on that. Um, but I'm a futurist educator. I'm a researcher. I'm a writer. Um, and that means basically that I teach I do consulting work, and I also publish. And um, I see myself as doing something that I call strategic social foresight. And all that is is that I'm very interested in society. Um, I come from a social sciences background. Academically, I was studying um, anthropology as an undergraduate when I encountered future studies. So um, I find that they go very well together, and I really bring it to – I, I'm interested in the future of education, the future of families, women and children, the future of our communities. I'm very interested in technology, of course, but I find that those are my core areas and I look at how, you know, other things are, are affecting them. So I really love looking at, you know, education and things that people do together and what the future of that looks like. Uh, so turn a little bit of the arc about how you got here. So you, you studied anthropology as an undergrad and it is actually, there, it's a fair, it's interesting how many women in this series have that as a shared background. Uh, but I also think that, you know, it's interesting because I always think of anthropology as the cultures in the past and here is this whole like shift around to what it means for the future. Uh, so how'd you get here? Totally. Yeah. So I was an anthropology major. I was actually a sociology major at first at the oh, University yeah. of Houston. This is important for later. <laughs> uh, I attended the University of Houston um, and I decided to switch to anthropology. And I was in probably my second semester of like intro type courses. And I had a professor who was super cool, um, Ann Bragdon, who I think is still around here in Houston at Houston Community College now. But she decided she had attended the World Future Society Conference one summer and she decided I need to teach a course on this I'm going to create an anthropology course about the study of the future or whatever and she got a couple of students including me to agree to be her guinea pigs like if I make this class will you take it and so I did and I actually really enjoyed the course obviously right I was halfway through college ish and I you know and I was like this is really interesting I'm just going to kind of put that in the back of my mind while I finish my bachelor's degree um, and actually I was introduced then to um, Dr. Peter Bishop who a lot of people know from the University of Houston graduate program he was running it at the time and he was a guest speaker in that class so again I kind of put that in the back of my mind like okay this is something that really speaks to me uh, but you know I finished my graduate degree and uh, my undergraduate degree and I did at that point I decided yeah I'm going to go straight to grad school for studies of the future. So I've had a very academic path. I mean I started with a college course an elective, right? Um and then I went straight into the grad program. Spent a couple of years there and got a lot of really good experience, great education with uh, Dr. Wendy Schultz and Dr. Chris Jones. Of course, Dr. Bishop was there. Um, so kind of like when you did the undergrad course that um, the first professor created, did they have a graduate program already? Yes. The U of H graduate program is uh, a little bit older than I am. I mean, it's been around for 40 something years. So yeah, that's something that's really stunning. It's the University of Houston and in Hawaii, right? There's a sort of those two centers, it seems to be, of uh, future studies. More, in a more formal way. That's correct. Uh, yes, both of them U of H. Yeah. It's kind of interesting. <laughs> U of H I Houston, know. U of H Hawaii. Right, right. Yeah, true. Um, and so the one at the University of Houston is, again, in the vein of the social sciences, we were in the, let me think, um, humanities and human sciences there, I think. This was at the University of Houston Clear Lake, which is sort of a annex campus of the University of Houston. Um, yeah. It's currently housed in the College of Technology where Dr. Hines runs it. Um, 
at the main campus of the University of Houston. But yeah, at that time, and so it's been around forever. It's kind of morphed yeah. a little over the decades, but it, it did exist then. So that's how come uh, my original professor of future studies was able to reach out to the Claire, Le- you know, the stu- grad program and say, come talk to my class, tell us about what you do. And it was a great connection. I, I guess I'm just lucky that I was in the right place at the right time. I was born in Houston. I'm a native Houstonian, um, you know, U of H all the way. Um, so I was just lucky that it, it was perfect for me. It fit right in. And so to complete the story, I did graduate from U of H Clear Lake with my uh, degree in studies of the future. And so I went on to work a little, you know, projects and stuff like that. And, you know, moving along the way, um, the kind of interesting part is how I ended up teaching that same course at the University of Houston downtown. I met someone there um, a few years later at some sort of meeting we're talking uh, I think we were on the same committee at a, at a, a nonprofit board and he said oh we used to have this study of the future class I, I just don't know anyone that could teach it and I'm like well I'm a futurist actually and I've taken that class it was a weird coincidence right place and right time right <laughs> I love it so lo- that's my story I ended up teaching that course five or so years after I graduated from the master's program And now I'm still teaching, not that course anymore, but now I'm teaching at the Strategic Foresight, uh, where the Strategic Foresight grad program is located at the University of Houston. I now teach undergraduate courses about, you know, future studies, just basic electives. Uh, We're in human, uh, human development, consumer sciences. So we touch on a lot of the social stuff that I like, and there's also this like human development aspect uh, where we're talking about how society is evolving alongside technology and stuff like that. So I'm curious as like because you've been teaching now for over ten years, right? How that's long true. Have you been yes. Mm-hmm. Um, the 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 kinds of and that's not questions, but like the context that the students are bringing into the class, right? It's obviously changes uh, every year as the world continues to unfold. But I'm also trying to think about the students themselves, like. The world, I mean, they're growing up with social media, they're thinking so much more about the environment, like, how does that impact, like, how would you sort of describe today's student who's interested in future studies? You know, I I definitely work with Gen Z these days, and I have noticed a marked difference now that we'd, when I started, it was millennials, and now that I'm working with a lot of the Gen Z kids, they are super passionate about the future. They are also extremely scared. And very, very stressed and sort of obsessed with what's going to happen to us. Are we even going to make it? Do we have that much? Do we have time left on this planet? Can I even have kids? Will, I, will grandkids even be a thing for me? They're, they're very realistic. And um, I have mentioned in other talks that I think Gen Z is really crazy about the environment and nature. Like they love nature and they embrace it. And I think it's a really good thing. Um, so, and I, I think that they're very in touch with the natural world and their place in it. And it's, it's just a totally different perspective. So I'm very uplifted by what I see with these students these days, but they definitely um, have a, a much better grasp on a futurist mindset than I think probably any generation before them. They That's awesome. really get it. I, I, I'm, I'm encouraged to hear that they get it, right? I guess the question is, because when you say that, literally chills go through my body in terms of their fears of the future. Like we see the same thing. And I talk about that in almost every one of my keynote talks. Um, and so the question is, so I'm on a mission to try and change that narrative for them so that they see that the future is actually being built by us. It's not happening to us. We get to go build it. And we're going to be part of the force of shifting it. And there's a stat that I just quoted this morning that like 42%, I think, of the world's population is under 25 you know, I think it's 52% or under 30. I mean, there's a, I mean, they're a powerful group and it can have a huge, huge impact on who gets elected and what policies get made and how we consume things and how we build things and how we steward things, et cetera. Uh, so do they feel better toward the end of the course or do they feel more overwhelmed by the end of your course? Mm, I think they might feel like they have a little bit more influence and control over the future I, because I think that's what we try to teach at, in the University of Houston, you know, is that we can't, if by understanding it better, you know, sort of that knowledge is power type approach because we teach people how to research about the future, how to understand what's changing. And, and yeah, I think it empowers them to feel like I can have an effect. And at least if they don't feel like they can have an effect, they know what's coming and they know how to find it. That is the one thing students come back to me later and say, I think about things differently. I, I read the news differently since taking your class. I pay attention to a lot more stuff. So I think that's kind of the payoff. And I think when you're talking about who elects our future um, representatives and so forth, who is the, the voting 
voters of tomorrow. Yeah, that's very reassuring. <laughs> right? I mean, that, that does make me feel really great. So if there's, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm really, again, I'm not trying to take an entire year's worth or a semester's worth of learning and bullet into two bullet points, but are there a couple of things that you can, that you share with them to sort of turn something lights on for them in some way, shape or form. Like if you, because the reason I'm saying that is very selfishly is if we have younger people who get to watch this podcast and don't get the benefit of being in your class, what would you want them to know? Um, well, I don't think it's anything that they need to know, but I teach them the way to, a certain way of thinking and how to do things. So I think a couple of the exercises that I do with my classes always get some really great feedback because they're both, this particular example that I'll give you is very introspective and it's very social. Um, so I do this activity called predicting the zeitgeist and mm -hmm. it's something I've developed um, kind of just on my own. It's a really fun assignment. It's a group assignment, but it basically involves looking at your own generation. I'm really interested in generations, you know? Um, and so you look at your own generation and you define a few characteristics about it on your own sort of a thinking process, you can then get with a group of people and compare your answers. But the next step is to, as a group or individually, to think about the next generation, the generation coming up next, maybe Gen Z, but maybe something after that. I, I leave it very open, but you get to name your generation and you get to say, what are these same sort of characteristics um, in these categories that you thought of for your own generation? It's things like, what is their key technology? What is their key, um, what is their ideal type, right? What are their, what are their values? It's just a set, a list of things that sort of tells you what people are all about. So I think that anything that we can do to get people to be introspective about themselves first, you know, have that as part of it and then think about the future because it, it makes it more personal and it makes it, um, it makes us connect with, the future generations that don't exist. You know, if you say it's, they're going to be just like us, they're going to have a technology that defines them. I mean, for Gen Z, you know, it's the Pac-Man arcade or whatever it might've been, right? Atari. But for millennials, it's something else. For Gen Z, it's something separate. So I like how, I like letting people identify with something collectively in the present and in the past, and then ask them, okay, how can we collectively identify with the future? Um, what did they do? Did they because I've I've done not, not that exercise, but similar stuff where people do that, and they do end up having kind of a, a shared sense of what they think that might that technology might be for the future. So, is there something that's sort of patterned of what it is they imagine the next generation will have as their defining technology? Um, well, a lot of people will say self-driving cars. Ah, uh, yeah. So that's interesting that they really yeah. Do you have one? What would you imagine that defining technology for the next generation? Oh, gosh. Um, you know, I'm going to say uh, neurotech. Oh, brain it's hacking. neurotech. It's brain hacking. Um, Elon Musk has a company called Neuralink. That's probably yeah. the best known example. And that recently demonstrated, I think, a, some kind of monkey playing a video game with its brain or chimpanzee. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, but other companies are looking into this. I think Valve perhaps was that the CEO of Valve, a big video game company said the video game of the future will be controlled with your mind and this sort of thing. So I think, yeah, that's the next generation may just, you know, control their laptop by just thinking, okay, switch on, open this, start my email, I whatever. Yeah. Imagine. It's funny. I've always teased that I wish there were psychic emails. So that, I think about it like I'm in the grocery store or I'm driving or whatever. I think, oh, I need to get back to somebody. And I'm like, God, I wish I could just like think it. And then I'm like, oh my God, thank God. That doesn't exist. <laughs> I really would need that edit, like delete function to make sure you've got that time to get it back in case you really didn't mean to send that. Um, so it is hard to imagine that we'll be able to control this, you know, the conscious, subconscious, or, you know, that the speed with which it is, we'll be able to do this. You know, one thing I've definitely observed, and I don't know if you've got children of your own, but I've got three young adults now, um, between the ages of almost 18 and 24. Um, and just to watch like how fast they play video games, you know, or take in information and all these different sources. Like my oldest literally walks through the world with like a Twitch stream and a Reddit stream and a whole like kind of annotated layer on top of like the real world because he just feels like the real world is like so slow. They don't like going to movies anymore because they just feel like they're slow. Um, so I also think that they're just processing really fast. So you imagine that, I don't know if you've again experienced or witnessed that in your classrooms. Like, do they, like, read? Like, I guess part of it would actually be interesting even how you teach in the sense of, are they still reading materials? Are they watching videos? Are they creating things? Like, just their own way of being able to, to work with info, mm -hmm. I think, is so different. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm teaching completely online now. Um, 
sort of coincidentally, you know, at the same time as COVID hit, when everything went online anyway, I had actually just moved everything online for my own convenience. I've been teaching online for 10 years. So one of my classes has been online for 10 years. So I've been, and I'm very used to it. You know, for me, it's pretty common. Um, so I, it's a different experience when you're in the classroom, when you're online. I will say that when I was in person, one of the funnest parts of the class, because we tend to talk about a lot of breakthrough stuff that not everyone knows about, like Bitcoin and, you know, these neurotech things that people I've heard of, but not everyone's heard of. So there was a lot of like in-class Googling on your phone. I always thought it was uh, you know, where people would be like, wait, I, oh, you said that term, I just searched it and I found this article. So it was, our discussions uh, in person were frequently like happening in real time. We were informing ourselves in real time about what's the latest with this technology or what has, what crazy thing has someone done with it now? You know, um, we could have these cool, like real time scanning, you know, horizon scanning sessions almost. Right, right, right. We're just, right. We're oh, just looking good. up stuff in real time and saying, wow, that's interesting. Let's all watch this video. I would often um, just Google stuff on my computer in the front of the classroom and show on the screen, like whatever videos or whatever people were kind of interested in watching. Um, so I think what you're, you know, it matches up with what you were saying, which is that they process stuff really fast because they're the, the Google generation, they Google stuff. Right. I mean, they, everything. They, everything. Everything. And so with that kind of surface level info always there, I mean, it really changes what education is all about. Right. I mean, we really don't need to know the I don't know the characteristics of a proton when it's so easy to just Google it and know that real quick and then move on to whatever you're talking about with protons. <laughs> right. And don't whatever. you think that shifts in education? Because I do think it's really been interesting. I mean, I've only seen early programs and I haven't really kept up with this at all, but you know, the schools that were already shifting to the fact that it would be open book or open Google exams where it was like, listen, if you can find it online, great, but we need to do the critical thinking on top of that or synthesize this plus this plus this equals that. So it's not like you can just find the answer. And uh, do you feel like that is shifting at all in the world of education? I mean, I hope so. I certainly hope so. I know that I have tried to achieve more of that, like, flipped classroom effects so that on the occasions when I'm with the students or we have everything's online now, but, you know, I would try to emphasize conversations and things that we do together, group projects like the one I described earlier about the generations, where you actually sit and talk. Like I would have them prepare their answers prior to coming to class so that when you get there, you have your stuff ready and you're ready to just interact and engage. So I think the social aspect of the classroom hopefully is being played up. I mean, I know it is in my classes, even in the online versions, I really encourage people to um, Again, get, you know, take an open book test. I have no problem with people using notes and books and Google on a test, but you know, make sure that you know what you're looking for because if you, the first time you crack the book open is during the test, that's not going to work. You know, it's right, really exactly. It, it's really about being able to find the information when you need it, being able to provide the the source and all of that if necessary, um, and and know how to do that, know how to analyze the information, synthesize the information. Um, it's not important that you memorize the information. Really right. So, so this is an interesting additional question, right? Because when we start talking again now about fake news or synthetic media or this idea about what we can trust and what we can't trust, um, my older son and I again had this conversation that he believes that his generation and even younger are developing a really fast, I don't know, bullshit meter is the right word, but a literacy that allows him to quickly say that doesn't make sense or it's not congruent or not don't believe it or whatever. Um, and so he feels like boomers. Like he's definitely that sort of like, you know, okay, boomer-ish guy who loves to point out, you know, how boomers have done things in the past and is not super happy with how we've left the world. Um, but do you believe that, I guess, so I, partly as an educator, partly as a futurist, ask you, like, this idea about what information we can trust when we, you know, just go Google something now and into the future. How do you feel about that, or what are some of your perspectives? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Um, I, what I always tell my students and my kids alike is where, you know, check where you got the information, see who else is saying it. I'm, I'm all about like triangulating your source, right? Go and see who else is saying it, verify it. Um, when my students come to me with something really cool about technology, but it's dated from four years ago, I ask them to Google it again, see what's happening now that it's changed. I promise you something new has happened. Look it up. Right. Or if nothing's happened, that's news too. Right. Did it stall out four years ago? Where is it today? So I'm all about, you know, looking up multiple sources, knowing um, what you're relying on. I mean, 
so, and it, it means being a well-read person. You know, you need to read a lot. It does, but again, Alexander, the part that freaks me out is when GPT-3 can re- you know, replicate any scientific study. It can replicate any, you know, whether it's written or whether eventually it'll be, you know, video that'll be convincing. The question will be that we think it's coming from a trusted source and it won't necessarily be right. coming from a trusted source or it'll mimic the, you know, uh, attributes of the trusted source that I, that actually really does when I think about some of the things that scare me like I'm a really you know hugely optimistic person I really believe that we have this opportunity to build a better next but uh, there are certain things that I don't know that we've fully figured out how to wrap our heads around and like with AI and bias at least I feel like I've got some places I can orient toward or when I think about you know the fact that we're going to have to deal with big huge uh, employment dislocation I can kind of like have some things that I can kind of advocate for, but in this world of the deep fake uh, and the synthetic, I, I don't know that we have really good answers for it yet. Uh, I have to agree. I mean, I, one of the things that really freaks me out is the reanimated historical photos. Have you seen those? Yes. Uh, I was actually having a conversation with someone recently where uh, we're talking about immortality and and that sort of thing, transhumanism, and I was you know, wondering if one day we're going to have to put in our will or our living will, whatever you might call it, please don't reanimate any pictures of me or don't, you know, don't turn me into a hologram to come back to Thanksgiving, you know, completely. I don't want to. (laughs) Um, There's a woman, another woman, Kathy Hackle, that we started this series with that I'm following Kathy's work. I know Kathy is amazing. Um, And such a generous contributor on LinkedIn with the things that she's learning. But, uh, you know, she talks about the job titles of the future and digital embalmer. Mm-hmm. You're like, <laughs> That's so weird. Um, do you know Richard Boyd's work? He's the one who uh, reanimated his dad after his father passed away, and he's doing all this. It's a really, really interesting work. His, his company is Tanjo. Uh, .io, um, and he has a long history in working in this field. But he is, um, yeah, his father passed away, and so he took all the writings and the various things that his father had left, and he sort of created a synthetic version, or a, a, you know a digital version, virtual version of his dad, and he will go and have conversations with his dad about current headlines and sort of see how his dad would probably have interpreted, I mean, through his, you know, use of AI, um, how his dad would have reflected on the current election or on what's happening with an environmental headline or whatever, which is really, you know, stunning to imagine that we will be able to do that. And again, his dad had so much less to work with. Imagine how much media, you know, trail we're leaving uh, that someone could recreate that with. So. That's the part I think that we are uh, really, we just can't really even envision how that's going to shift and change us. I was having a conversation with another client around something that we can predict some of the actual advances of the technology, but we can't predict is probably the timing and probably how humans are going to react with it. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, for me, one of the most interesting examples around that is Wikipedia. We go from thinking about the fact that we can create online versions of catalogs of data or information, sorry, not data, um, like the encyclopedia, which is going to turn into Encarta. And what you realize is actually by being able to do that, we can now create the conditions for a hive version that can be updated every minute around the world with people who don't get paid for it and has a very, very different model around it. So I think that's the kind of thing that'll be fascinating as we move forward. And we think to not just the more advanced digital version of what currently exists, but the thing that doesn't exist yet at all. Is there a story that you tell about helping people understand? Oh, sorry, I don't want to interrupt you. No, I just wanted to, you know, sort of as a counterpoint, say that to me, I think the bigger fear, I'm actually more scared of um, everything that we now have on digital getting wiped out by some unforeseen event than I'm worried about the fake information. Because it, it, we're, I've read other people talk about this, you know, we could be facing a serious dark age if we lose through an EMP, solar flare, or some other source that we don't even know about yet. But everything is digital. Contracts, photos, historical records, legal documents, um, all of it is stored electronically. Our society will be crippled, completely crippled, by the loss of these digital records. And everything's going to the cloud. There's nothing stored. I don't think I have a baby picture of my kids on paper. Very few. You know, it's very, very few. How old are your children? Uh, 10 and 14. Sorry, I had to think about uh, that. <laughs> 10, 10 and 14. I almost said nine. 
Well, it's funny because interestingly, again, because I've got one that was born in 1997 and the other like 2000, 2003. And so there's really this marked thing where I've got a lot of pictures of Hugo, my oldest, and like some of Zane and almost none of yeah. Harper by the time we got there. But I used to like every on New Year's Day, that was part of my thing is I would give the kids a handful of photos from them that past year. I would literally go and take a bunch of the digital photos and have whatever, 20 of them printed and put them in a little album so they would have some version of an analog version of their story. Yeah. Just, just in case. And partly, and also for me, it's a format thing. Like I've got all kinds of things from 2000 that I don't know how to get to anymore because that hard drive isn't available or the CD thing doesn't work anymore, or blah, blah, blah. Like the formats have just changed. Um, and so, yeah, I do think that there is, um, a, yeah, I, a, I haven't really thought about it from the whole world crushing side of it, but I definitely agree with you. And again, there was a stat that 18, so here's the, the counterpart to that, which is that if, um, I forgot what it was, like, 80% of the world's information has been created in the last 18 months, right? We're also like over creating so much information. Like, do we need to save all of that forever, right? And have that filed forever. So I do think that, you know, we'll become more discriminating around what gets saved for what periods of time. I mean, even my email, people laugh at me. I've got 80,000 unread emails or emails in my bank. <laughs> and those are just the ones over the last three years. I've archived some of the older ones. Um, and it's not because every one of those is important. They just were important for the 30 days that I needed them to be important, right? For a meeting that I need to make sure of it or invoice that I was following up on or conversation I was having with someone. And then at some point it expires, but I'm not going to go back and clean all that stuff out. Like I just need to be time stamped in a way that I don't have to think about the fact that I have to get rid of that. So I think we're going to get hopefully better at managing information and build systems that make it less manual for us to have to sort through that because I'm, I'm deluged. I can only imagine you know, where it's going to go in the future. So for sure. Um, so in terms of what you're working on right now, we'll just sort of close around the corner here about what you're working on right now, what you're passionate about in particular. Is there something that you're yeah. doing? Oh, well, I'm doing a bunch of stuff right now. Um, really interesting stuff. Let's see. I'll start big, which is that I'm working on a book about the kids, the generation of kids growing up during the pandemic. Oh, um, wow been sort of just researching it for the past uh, six to eight months, um, and now I'm ready to start writing. I was kind of waiting for the dust to settle after the U.S. elections, and I just sort of want to see what happened there. But I'm really interested in things like this recent statistic that people have been throwing around really disturbing about, I think it was 40,000 U.S. children, American children, are now orphans, lost one or both parents during COVID. It's a huge number. I didn't know that. I've been, this, I've been looking at the food insecure and looking at anxiety levels and suicide. Yeah. Oh my yeah. God. So it's, a, I mean, it's, it's a generational impact, right? The whole pandemic, the whole thing, not being able to go to school and having to be socially distanced and the masks and everything. I mean, I feel like it's really having, I, and everyone agrees, right? It, the kids of Corona are growing up differently. And I think that they're going to have a different impact on the future because of it. So I'm looking at collecting information right now about what's going on, what is their experience, and then projecting some scenarios about what they might do. And I think they're going to do something great um, in 40 to 50 years. Okay. I'm, you know, I'm looking far out into the future, but I want to see, you know, where their life trajectory goes after this, because I really, it's really about the future of America and the future of um, our country and democracy in a lot of ways. So um, that's sort of my big passion right now that I'm you know, constantly reading about and collecting information, getting started, getting ready to start writing, um, hopefully this Yay. summer. Do you have a no, um, title for it yet? Do you know what it'll be titled? Uh, I have tentatively titled it Growing Up Corona, but we'll see. Um, yeah, we'll that's see, the working yeah, title. I think it's, I, I'm so excited that you're doing it. I was uh, just shared with Emma, actually, that there was an article I read probably just uh, two days ago or three days ago, I put it on Twitter. And it was a really, really thoughtful conversation on exactly that. Because I think that we talk about the fact that they may have missed a year of school or they missed so-and-so, but it actually for teenagers, what an extraordinary moment of formation where they should be out there taking risks and exploring the world. And all that has been, you know, taken away from them. So just their home brain development around not being able to be with your peers for many, depending on the family. But, um, and actually that was one thing I did let my kids do is spend time with friends early on. Um, small bubbles, but they're certainly not completely isolated, but there are many kids who have been. Uh, and along with, to your point around, I didn't know the death stat, but the food insecurity stat, the parents who've lost their job and can't pay their rent, the parents who are super stressed out about various other things. So we do, I think we sometimes forget that there's a, a very, um, poignant, close context of their lives that has been really dramatically affected by this and has a more, you know, foundational impact on them. The parents will get through it, but for the kids, it's a pretty fundamental thing. 
Um, and so I love that you're going to be exploring that and helping us better understand how to navigate this with and for them. And I love the fact that you see that there's an upside to it, that they won't be traumatized by it, but that they will be catalyzed by it. Yeah. I mean, I think that we can't ignore that they have been traumatized and the, and the trauma, the post-traumatic is something they're going to deal with. Um, but I think it can be expressed in healthy ways um, if we choose to. You know, I want to, I really want to emphasize the ability to change, influence, drive our own future through these scenarios. So, yeah, I'm trying to keep it positive. That's no, I'm uh, <laughs> If you have to think about like ways in which you can uh, more positively process the trauma, is there any way which you can help people imagine what that looks like? You know, I really don't have any answers, but some of the stuff that I've seen that I think is cool is um, people kind of keeping journals, creating a time capsule. Um, I encourage my kids to keep a journal, and they were like, Mom, that is so dark. <laughs> Why would you say that? <laughs> my son's like, what is this, Anne Frank? You know? <laughs> I know, it's like, nobody's been talking about that. That's totally. But you know what's funny? I actually have in my camera roll an album that is the, post -pan uh, is the pandemic photo journal. So, like, when we went to the store and there was, like, no food on the shelves, like, I took a picture of it. <laughs> or like we had to wear a mask to go to something random and took a picture of it like I just felt like there's this is weird moment in time we're going to want to record in some way so I've got this little collection if you need some photos I've got a collection of photos from the past year of uh, these weird experiences that we never thought we'd ever encounter and here we are so mm -hmm. uh, fascinating well um I am um, so that was one was there anything else you want to talk about in terms of what you're um, not particularly. I have a couple of other projects going on, but just all the, you know, just the usual writing some articles, doing some talks and projects and teaching. So, <laughs> so the last thing I'll ask you then in terms of the keynotes and, and talks that you're giving, is there a particular topic that you're really passionate about that you'd love to talk about? Um, well, I'm obsessed with biophilia, uh, which is love of nature. I was talking about Gen Z and Gen Alpha even who love nature and it's a design trend. It's a, it's a living trend. I think it's the healthiest trend we have going right now I think it's a great thing for everyone to embrace because we're finding all this stuff about how like looking at leaves and like being in the same room with a plant even looking at the wood grain I interviewed a, an architect recently who specializes in biophilic design and he talks about how just natural wood just looking at it carries these natural fractals Okay, like wood grain has fractals and apparently looking at fractals like increases our like serotonin or something like it. Lit we're literally designed to see things in nature and for it to make us happy. So I'm really obsessed with that. I talk about it and write about it a lot lately. Biophilia in the home and in our workplaces and our schools, just, you know, getting closer to nature. I think it's one of the best things we can do right now. Excellent. One of my three is a super nature guy. The other two, I think I need to push out a little bit more. But uh, I'm glad to know that Zane is well prepared for, and he's a guy actually who's studying AR and VR um, oh, wow. at UT and, and really thinking through what our immersive futures will be. So I think it's actually really fascinating to see a kid who loves to spend all his time camping and rock climbing. He's also the kid who's building these immersive virtual environments. Mm -hmm. So that I think is the juxtaposition of the future. Right? So. Thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you so much, Alexandra. Again, I appreciate your time and I love getting to know you and I hope our paths cross. We keep talking about the fact that someday there'll be a, a gathering of us somewhere, somehow on the planet. So we will um, keep envisioning that. The way I look at it is at some point it'll come true if I just manifest it long enough. So <laughs> stay tuned. Um, and uh, any you know, questions or things that come up and we can help you with, just let us know. So thank All you. All right, sounds good. Thank you so much. Thanks.